thank you to you and Lena and Rita for organizing all of this and bringing us all together. Uh, today, we'll hear uh, Martin speak about slimming down and hopefully we'll uh, get some insightful um, information. Uh, but let me start with two things. So first of all, to try to share my presentation. <laughs> hopefully this works, great. Um, so a bit of um, housekeeping. As I've learned, there's a little Q&A um, window on the bottom. So any questions you might have, please just type them as we um, go along. Also, you can upvote questions. So if somebody else asks a question that you're also really interested in, please uh, like it, and then it will come on top of the list so we can determine the priority for um, answering. And the um, plan for today is, so I'll give a very brief introduction on self-assembly and to introduce Martin's topic and Martin as a scientist. Uh, then we'll hear Martin uh, speak about his research uh, after which we'll answer the questions from the Q&A. And this will kind of conclude the first part, um, and the official talk part. Then we'll have um, meet the speaker session where actually we'll all join as panelists. So people will also be able to speak and kind of have an informal discussion with Martin about um, this topic or any other aspect of his research or thoughts. Okay, so um, I hope that's clear enough. So today I'll start with a brief introduction on self-assembly, which is kind of the overarching topic of, I guess, what we'll hear about today from Martin. So what is self-assembly? It's kind of, to me, still a magical process where dispersed nanoscale building blocks, kind of they have weak interactions and are jiggled around by thermal fluctuations, spontaneously come together into beautiful self-assembled organized structures that are often functional. And actually we learned about this process from soft materials that we see in everyday life. For instance, um, surfactant molecules in your soaps, uh, they have kind of a polar head and a hydrophobic tail. And then to, when they're dispersed in water, their tails want to hide away from water. So all molecules kind of self-organize into my cells that I'm showing here that often in the middle also have some other hydrophobic molecules such as pieces of dirt or kind of fat. And this is how, I guess, cleaning products work. But also like um, all gels that we use in um, everyday life, liquid crystals in your screens, those are all examples of nanoscale molecules that self-assemble into a certain type of structures. And the same kind of physical principles very much um, build us, like the living materials. So if you look into the cell, cell membranes, um, which you know envelop the cell and build the internal compartments are basically self-assembled lipid molecules and um, proteins and sugars and um, kind of in, into a unique structure. And it, the physics is still very much the same one um, that I've discussed in the case of surfactants, right? The tails want to go away from water, so they pack into some bilayers that then enclose itself um, in the plasma membrane or internal structures. But also proteins, um, they self-assemble due to the same hydrophobic or um, screened charge or polar interactions. And they build filaments and networks that uh, give shape and support the cell, but also produce mechanical forces for motility, transport, and cell division. And then finally, also DNA and associated proteins also self-organize into regions that have certain uh, functions kind of in the whole chromatin structure. And then in the recent years, um, what became particularly popular are little droplets that are uh, membraneless, membraneless compartments inside the cell, which is, or inside the nucleus, which are basically you know, cases where um, molecules, certain molecules like each other more than they like the uh, environment around them. So they condensate into droplets, which perhaps have less structure than the cases I've shown you earlier, but it still, I think, falls under a general umbrella of self-assembly. And so now I've told you, you know, there are many examples of self-assembly, but probably the simplest self-assembly form are fibrils. 
So it's basically when um, molecular building blocks stack on top of each other into kind of a 1D structure. And since molecules are rarely perfectly symmetric, often they stack under certain angles, so you get a twist and some overall shape of the fibril. And those are, as I said, uh, one-dimensional homomolecular structures, and they're really workhorses of, of the cell, right? So here, actin and um, microtubules, they produce mechanical forces, um, and they uh, enable cells to transport. They um, create shape changes involved in uh, division, morphogenesis, and so on. So it's very tempting to think that you know, these proteins have evolved their shape and interactions to create self-assembled structures of a certain shape. But then also um, in the recent decades, it became clear that filaments can also represent junk in the cell. Many misfolded proteins, or actually almost any protein if sufficiently destabilized, can aggregate into a certain type of a filament called amyloid fibr filament, which is shown here. They're also actually quite beautiful from a structural point of view, so they're these cross beta sheet structures. And these structures usually don't have a function, so it's also tempting to think that they haven't been evolved. Um, but either way, this um, kind of poses a question if there are perhaps some general principles behind filament formation, kind of um, that where general kind of physical properties of proteins would favor filament formation over some other structures. And I think this is something that uh, we'll hear about uh, today from Martin. And let me just um, introduce Martin's research briefly. So he uses theoretical soft metaphysics to investigate you know, the mechanics of living systems, very much from cellular components that I've just shown out all the way to whole organisms. So he's currently a CNRS researcher at University of Paris-Saclay and ESPCI in Paris. He was previously postdoc at Chicago, and he did his PhD at Institute Curie, where lots of um, biophysical breakthroughs came uh, from. And he won many awards, um, ERC starting grant, of course, the um, uh, most important one, EMBO uh, Young Investigator Prize. And recently, as I've learned, um, a Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel Research Award, which I think enabled him to do some research in Germany in near future. So, Martin, please, the floor is yours. I'll make room for you to share. Thank you so much. Uh, let's uh, make sure. So does the presentation work, Angela? Okay, fantastic. So, I mean, first of all, I want to thank Rita, Lena, and Gerlind for uh, organizing this whole series of talks, which, you know, I've very much enjoyed the one from last month, and I think we're up for many great ones in the future. And, of course, to... Uh, thank Angela for this beautiful introduction. It's so great that it kind of robs me of my own introduction so we can jump into the, the matter very quickly. I think she's beautifully introduced this idea that during uh, many diseases, actually, you have proteins that are normally, uh, normally soluble inside the cell that actually go and form fibers. And amyloids are one type of example of this behavior, but there's actually many others. And so at the end of the day, you find yourself with this phenomenology of having objects that are not specifically evolved to self-assemble into one shape or another, but there's this common behavior that they all aggregate into fibers. And as a very naive physicist, this always looked a little bit puzzling to me because, you know, if you think about it in the simplest possible term, you think that you have those objects that start to stick to each other. And if you just have stuff that has a complicated shape that sticks together, well, you know, perhaps the most likely outcome would be some kind of an amorphous blob, but that's not what they appear to be doing. And of course, that's not something new, right? People have known about this for a very long time, and they have specific molecular explanations for the formation of each of those types of fibers and more. And what we want to do is not necessarily question, or not at all, to question those explanations, but rather to take a step back and ask whether across all those different molecular mechanisms, there could be um, you know, a common generic physical phenomenon that would explain this fiber formation. And what I'll do right now is that I'll explain it the only way that I know how, which is by waving my hands around. So that requires 
taking the presentation away. So just imagine that you have two of those, of those particles, right? That's, that's, that's the idea that I have in my mind. So they're complicated geometrically. They have um, you know, um, mountains and valleys, and they have places that stick more and places that stick less. So let's imagine that you just have them in solution, perhaps inside the cytoplasm, and they just diffuse away, they find each other. And because they've become sticky because of a you know, mutation, this folding event, they stick together and they negotiate a little bit and they find the best possible relative orientation with respect to one another. Good, that's your first timer, right? But now imagine that you have a third identical protein that comes in and it also wants to join the aggregate. Well, the best sticking place is already taken. So it's gonna have to do something different. And there's at least two different things that it can do. One of them is to deform the existing aggregates to get some of that sticky goodness that's inside my hands. Or what it could also do is settle for a less favorable binding spots on another side of the pre-existing dimer. So you know, whether it chooses one or the other, it appears that the second binding event is energetically or free energetically less favorable than the first. And you can imagine that if you come in with a fourth particle, the fifth and the sixth, at every time, the problem is going to be more and more geometrically constrained. So you might imagine that as you build up the aggregate, the aggregation becomes energetically less and less favorable. And maybe at some point it will become so unfavorable that it's not going to be a good idea to come from the solution and into the aggregate anymore, but that the aggregation is going to stop. So that's the first part of the argument. That's the part of the argument that tells you maybe that buildup of geometrical frustration will result in an aggregate that has a limited size. But you know, how, why should you jump from this to a fiber? And the proposal gets even more hand-waving at this point, because what I'm saying is, you know, I've told you, and this is really the idea that I want you to get out of this, that there's a compromise between adhesion and the buildup of frustration as the aggregate gets more and more complex. Well, making a fiber is actually a pretty good compromise between those two tendencies because it's a large object. So you get a lot of adhesion inside of it, but at the same time, it has a diameter that's limited. So that means that every particle is relatively close to the surface of the aggregate and the surface is the least constrained of the places in the aggregate. So that means that it's also relatively favorable in terms of the frustration. And so that's, I guess, the idea that I'll try to you know, put forward in the rest of my talk, uh, starting with two different models that essentially outline the two basic ways of coping with frustration that I've introduced. One of them that consists in deforming the aggregate, and the second one that is this idea of you know, settling for a less favorable binding spot and into another direction. And then what I'll do is that um, you know, I'll take advantage of your brains and uh, you know, start throwing ideas around of the directions that we've been trying to go recently in trying to see whether you know, those ideas have any bearing in terms of real proteins. And the first thing that I'm going to do is that I'm going to discuss this model of forming amyloids and maybe argue that it's not so obvious that everything is an amyloid, because essentially the discussion that I'm having is not extremely well suited to describe amyloids, but um, you know, maybe there are things out there, maybe there's many things out there that don't fit that amyloid model. And the last piece has to do with harnessing uh, data that's already out there and unused in order to get an idea of whether you know, we're completely dreaming or you know, partly sane. But let me start with the deformability model. And essentially the take that we take on a protein at this stage is an extremely naive one. We consider proteins that are actually polygons in two dimensions, so extremely simplified. But even at this level, there's essentially two different types of polygons that I want you to differentiate. Here's the good ones and there's the bad ones. So what's a good polygon? A good polygon is one that when you put it together with their friends, they essentially tile the plane. You can cover the complete bathroom wall without any holes and without having to deform any of the tiles. And that's the case that doesn't incur any frustration upon aggregation. So you can just expand this tiling in all directions of space without any limit. But that's actually an extremely special case. Only a few shapes do this. Most of the shapes um, 
actually are incompatible in terms of tiling. And that's the case, for instance, of those irregular hexagons. And you see when I put them together, I immediately have to match a short with a long side. And in this case, I had to deform the hexagons a little bit to make them fit together. And so the whole object starts to develop a bend. And essentially, there's a certain cost to tiling the plane. You have to deform those objects. So now my question is, you know, let's consider such objects and make many of them aggregate together. What's going to be the most stable object that you can come up with? Well, there's two limiting cases that are fairly easy to understand from the get-go, right? So I told you again, and I'm going to tell it again, there's a competition between adhesion and frustration. And there's a parameter that tells you, you know, if you're not sticky at all or have very little stickiness, then frustration is always going to win. And that's the case in this picture here, where essentially the most favorable aggregate is to put those um, particles sticking just on one side and make that tree, which has an enormous surface, so a lot of missed opportunities in terms of sticking, but at the same time, you don't have to deform anybody. There's no frustration. The opposite extreme is one where the stickiness is extremely strong, and there you're always going to be able to force your particles into a regular bulk where each particle is going to be, you know, substantially tortured by its neighbors in order to fit that dense pattern. And essentially what we're proposing is that generically, if your objects are geometrically complicated enough, if they are prone to incurring frustration, there would be a third generic behavior that would be a compromise between those two. For intermediate adhesions, intermediate surface tensions, you would tend to get a fiber. So um, let's try to you know, be more specific about the type of model that we're going to be using here. And essentially, what we're going to do is that we're going to simulate this in the computer. And in the computer, we have a very naive view of adhesion, which is an all or nothing adhesion. So you can think of those polygons as completely adhered to each other, which means that those two sides have exactly the same length, and those vertices are uh, completely with the same coordinates or completely detached. And depending on this, the adhesion energy is going to be different. The other component of the energy of a single particle has to do with its deformability, the frustration part of the, um, of the energetic equation that I described before. And essentially, to understand the physics of this term, you have to understand the physics of a rubber balloon. So those particles are rigid for the same reasons than a rubber balloon. So how does a rubber balloon work? Well, first of all, there's a pressured gas inside of it which tends to expand the balloon in all directions. And that's that term one over A, which is energetically more favorable when the area of one of those hexagons is large. The second term is the analog of the membrane of the rubber balloon, because that membrane is essentially a harmonic spring that wants to shrink down to a point. And that's what's the six harmonic springs that I put on each of the sides of the hexagon want to do. And in order to get irregular sides, I essentially give them different spring constants. And the second part has to do with the stickiness, the adhesion. And it's a very simple way of taking it into account. I just have a certain number sigma at a surface tension that I multiply by the number of orange exposed sides in this case. And so in everything that I'm going to present now, the energy of the system is minimized with respect to the position of its vertices, which is just the same thing as saying that I have an aggregate that respects force balance. But of course, that doesn't tell me where each new particle should go inside the aggregate, right? So, and that's the, that's the meat of the problem. And, um, you know, to cut a long story short, essentially we explore this exact problem in the computer. And the way we do this is that we put the first particle here, in this case, it's a pentagon, not an irregular hexagon. And we come in with a new particle and we try to stick it to the existing particle. And so we try every possible position. So we try to stick it here and here and here and here. And we even try to you know, bind two sides at the same time because that deforms the aggregate a lot, but it's favorable in terms of, first, of, um, of adhesion. And then out of all those solutions, we take the most energetically favorable one. And then we move on to the third particle and renew exactly the same procedure and so on and so forth. And so the aggregate grow, grow, grows particle by particle. 
And here I'm just going to play the movie of how this works out. In the beginning, there's nothing very discernible that comes out of it. But then after a while, you know, almost magically, the aggregate appears to find some kind of a steady state where it grows and reproduces the same pattern all the time. And that pattern appears to be in the shape of a fiber. And that continues forever, the definition of forever being long enough for my audience to get bored. So I guess that completes the proof. So, you know, what's going on? And the real answer at this stage is I don't really know, but here's a way to think about it in a hand-waving manner. Imagine that you have a small aggregate that is you know, a little bit anisotropic. The question that you might ask is when I add a new particle, will it amplify the anisotropy or will it mitigate it and make the aggregate more fat, more spherical? And essentially, you know, that's a basic choice of adding a particle to the side of the aggregate or to the tip. Now, the advantage of adding it to the side is that the new particle is essentially going to tuck itself into the existing structure. And so the surface cost is going to be low. But at the same time, it's going to deform many neighbors. And this deformation is going to propagate into the aggregate, which makes for a relatively high deformation cost. And of course, if you put the uh, new particle at the tip, you have the opposite effect. So what sets the diameter of the fiber? Well, essentially, what you can imagine is that if your aggregate is very small, then it's relatively favorable to do this type of thing, because essentially the, the aggregate is small, and so the propagation of the elastic cost doesn't go very far, and so it's not too expensive. But as you do this more and more, you're going to build up an aggregate that's fatter and fatter, and so that deformation cost is going to go up and up, and then at some point, it will not be more favorable to go to the left anymore, but you're going to pretend that you're going to prefer to go to the right and start, you know, breaking the symmetry and extending the uh, system into a fiber. And I think the you know interesting part of that argument is that it doesn't say anything about the shape of the particle. It can apply indifferently to many different types of shapes, and that's indeed something that we've checked uh, again in the computer with a lot of different particle shapes. This is just a little sample. Pentagons, hexagons with different amounts of irregularity and uh, octagons here. And in all the cases in that intermediate regime of surface tension, we appear to get fibers very reliably. So that's you know, a nice phenomenology, but as theorists, what we'd like to do is to understand the process a little more. And to this effect, we've developed a series of models that essentially help us have a better handle of the phase diagram of this system. And I think one of them is the one that I'm picturing here. It's made of irregular hexagons of a slightly different type than I've described before, because those hexagons are, have red vertices and blue vertices, and you always have to stick red to red and blue to blue. And now those aggregates are going to be deformable again. And the way in which we introduce the deformability is to equip them with springs, black springs and blue springs and red springs. And this specific pattern of springs is actually very interesting because you can essentially analyze it in a lot of detail. And the basic trick is essentially to say that if you take all those particles and stick them together in the same way that I did before, you essentially end up with a triangular lattice of blue springs and another triangular lattice of red springs. But those springs don't have the same size. So it's as if you had two elastic sheets that you were trying to stick on top of each other, but the sheets have different sizes. And those black springs essentially connect the different points of the two elastic sheets. So in some way, you have to you know, the black springs want to keep the sheets at the same size, but the springs, sheets by themselves want to want to extend away from one another. So if you have very large sheets, essentially the black springs are always going to win, and you're going to frustrate the blue and red sheets very much. But if you have so smaller size aggregates, essentially the blue and uh, red are going to win towards the edges. You're going to have some mismatch at the edge and a certain characteristic elastic length that is going to set the physics of your boundary. And again, I'm going to cut a long story short by telling you that we've worked out the balance of the energy in all those cases, and we can determine uh, under which 
uh, physical parameters, you get disks, fibers, and bulks as a function of the surface tension. So it goes pretty much as I've announced before, right? You go from tree to fibers to bulks as you increase the surface tension. But what's quite interesting is that there's also a notion of the material properties of the objects that you're looking at, uh, specifically the elastic sheets that I've mentioned. And the more incompressible the elastic sheets are, the more they're going to tend to make fibers. And I think, you know, we haven't gone very far in understanding this, but I think it's seductive to think that proteins like to form fibers, uh, you know, and that coincides with the fact that proteins are not very compressible, that they're, you know, in many cases already globular. And if you push them in this direction, then they're going to have to expand in another direction. Um, and what we do, you know, on top of minimizing these energies of elastic sheets is run numerical simulations. And what you can see is that um, if you just do regular Monte Carlo simulations, you do reproduce this a pattern of going from low surface tension to larger surface tensions. In that region where you predict that there, there's going to be disks, you get broader and broader disks. And at uh, the top here, you start with relatively globular objects and then fibers that you know, start out fairly thin and then get broader and broader, and even though you know, at some point there's other issues that come into play and um, it's not an exact match. All right, so that was my you know, first discussion, which was that of the particles that were deformable. But I told you also, also that I wanted to look at the, this other way of accommodating frustration, which was essentially to bind in one direction or another, preferentially or not. And the other piece that I'd like to introduce here is the, an understanding of the kinetics of the things that happened in the, first, um, in the first model. It actually turned out that many of the fibers that I've shown you appear to be metastable, but it's not quite clear how long lived they will be. And finally, this third and final thing is that everything that I've told you until now was in two dimensions, but you know, that's not how, how life works. Uh, and um, I'm going to present to you a model that's actually 3D. So what does the model look like? Well, first of all, I'm going to explain it to you in 2D because it's easier to visualize, but I promise the 3D is coming. So the model is actually now one that lives on a lattice. So it's a triangular lattice. Each little site of that lattice can um, have a particle on it. The particle is actually the Voronoi cell of the lattice, in this case, the hexagon. And this is what a particle looks like. At each of the vertices of the particle, I've assigned a color, blue or yellow. And you can say, you know, blue is hydrophilic and yellow is hydrophobic, for instance. You can make up, you know, or positive and negative charges. There's all kinds of analogies that you can do. But the rule of the game, and the rule of the game doesn't matter too much, but in the specific example that I'm going to show you, blue likes blue and yellow likes yellow. So what does the dynamics of my model look like? I take a particle from a reservoir and I put it in the system. There you go. That doesn't change the energy. But then what I can do is that I can take a second identical particle from the reservoir and then move it next to its little friend. But look, here it has two blues. And that guy has a blue and a yellow. So that's not a match. That doesn't work. But I can make it work if I rotate the particle and put it here. Bam, I make a yellow coincide with a yellow and blue with a blue. That's two points of energy for me, as indicated here. Now imagine that you take yet another particle and you try to put it in that site. The problem here is there's three yellows, three consecutive yellows here, which are not found on their surface of your particle. So you can't do that. That is the place where the frustration starts to come into play. As you put more and more particles together, the problem becomes more and more constrained, and you have to do something else. And that something else can be to go stick uh, you know, at this location, provided you rotate your particle in the proper way, or even go stick at a place that's disconnected from the original aggregate. And an important thing here is um, to also allow the particles to not only to bind, as I did in the previous model, but also to unbind and go back to the reservoir or maybe to another place in the system. And I do this in a way that's consistent with detail balance in such a way that you're always going to end up with an equilibrium system if you wait long enough. OK, so as I told you, my system is not actually 2D. It's actually 3D. So the lattice is not a triangular lattice, it's an FCC lattice. And the um, 
Voronoi cell is not a hexagon, it's a thing that's called a rhombic dodecahedron. And here's what it looks like. It has 14 vertices, and each of them can be blue or yellow. So if you're very naive, you're going to say, oh, 14 vertices that I can color in two colors. That's two to the 14 possibilities in terms of coloring. But of course, uh, life is not that bad because there's many of those colorings that are equivalent to one another through a rotation of the particle and maybe an inversion or a flip of the, um, of the colors. So at the end of the day, the ones that are really distinct, there's only 200 and 88 of them. And you know, we could enter a detailed discussion of you know, which one of those is more like a protein and more like an inanimate object, but we don't want to do that. So we just brute force it and we simulate all of the 288, you know, see what sticks. Um, and we call them molecules, right? So that's that's what I'll be referring to in the in the following. So what happens when you do this? Well, I'm going to show you a simulation. And um, if we were in a real seminar, I would ask you to guess which one is going to give uh, you know, zero dimensional aggregates, fibers, planes, or crystalline bulks. And you would most likely all fail at it because it's very non-trivial to look at the individual particle and predict what preferred aggregate you're going to make on large length scales. So the procedure is essentially a Monte Carlo algorithm. The particles are hopping from site to site. And as time goes, I slowly lower the temperature in order to get my system as close to uh, as possible to its ground state. And this is what it looks like. And what's quite striking in my opinion is that you know, from particles that look pretty much just the same, you get very different morphologies. And those morphologies are really non-trivially related to the shape of an individual particle. Now, this relationship between you know, shape and aggregate structure is something that we're trying to understand, but I'm not going to tell you about this. I'm going to tell you about something different, which has to do with exploring how long-lived each of those structures is. And so what we can do once we have the structures that I've shown you before is to explore what their energy is, what their surface energy is, and get a criterion for how hard it is going to be to nucleate them. And we don't only take the structures that come from the previous simulation. We actually have an algorithm that allows us to almost exhaustively list all the structures, the periodic structures that are accessible for one of our molecules. Essentially, it's an exhaustive search up to a unit, a unit cell of size 60, or between 50 and 60 particles. And um, at the end of the day, we can compare the energies and the nucleation barrier for all of those different structures and predict which one is going to nucleate first, and then second, and then third. And so from this, you can essentially predict a timeline of which structure you're going to get over time. And here, that's plotted as a function of the nucleation energy, which is itself the log of the time for all of the particles that I've told you about before. So 100% is 288 particles. And you see that at early times, pretty much everybody starts 0D and 1D. And as the system ages, you go to something that's 2D or 3D. So it doesn't look too good for us because it looks like the fibers are always short-lived. You always end up with something that's 2D or 3D. But there's a caveat here, and the caveat is about the time, uh, the, the, the time scale here. So this is a log scale of the log of the time. So for those of you who know how to play with logs, this goes very, very fast. And essentially, you know, if you put reasonable parameters on the, on the, the energies in your system, the age of the universe is you know, somewhere around here. So even though the fibers are you know, technically transient, it appears to be the case that they're really you know, very uh, good metastable states, and that might explain why they form so readily. All right, so you know, I've told you about those objects that deformed a little bit or you know, changed orientation, but that's not the main reason why people say, people say you know, fibers form inside cells. In many, many cases, you have very dramatic unfolding of your particles, of your proteins, sorry, and then you stack the beta sheets in the way that Angela described before, and that's you know, top to bottom. That's how you form a fiber. That's not a very mysterious mechanism. 
So could it be the case that everything in the cell or everything that's a you know, pathological fiber is an amyloid and that's the final word of the story and the things that I told you, you know, don't make so much sense for the cell? Well, I don't exactly know, but this picture of a classical amyloid, I think is perhaps, you know, doesn't account for everything that we know today about the formation of those fibers. First of all, there's many examples, and I've shown you a little bit in the beginning that I'm reproducing here, where essentially the fibers that we know are not based on that dramatic unfolding of the particle and then stacking of the beta sheets. That's the case for um, the fibers involved in ALS as well as in sickle cell anemia. Um, there's also other cases where we can probe the mechanical characteristics of the fibers. And depending on you know, their uh, bending rigidity uh, as a function of their width, you can estimate whether this is consistent with uh, beta sheet stacking being dominant for, for being responsible for most of those mechanical properties. And that's the case, for instance, in that blue band here. But there are certain of those accidental fibers that actually don't fit that pattern, which strongly suggests that um, at least in those cases, there's other interactions that play a strong role. Now, even within the world of amyloids, things are, you know, as people are realizing, less uh, simple than people once thought. And there's a lot of polymorphism inside those, uh, those fibers. So this is, a, you know, this is a, a cut of an amyloid fiber. And you see that there's not just one way to stack the beta sheets, but there's you know, different states that are comparable in energy and will compete with each other, which is extremely reminiscent of the physics of um, frustrated systems. And um, finally, you know, there are simply some amyloids that depending on the temperature where you aggregate them, uh, they, or, you know, other physical parameter will sometimes make something that's very much like an amyloid, such as this, uh, you know, 4.7 angstrom to the minus um, one, um, sorry, angstrom, um, uh, ring here that you see in uh, in scattering, but in other cases, and in, for this one, it's a yeast prion. This is the physiological temperature. It will form something that looks nothing like it, which strongly suggests that it's another aggregation mechanism that's at work um, there. And the final thing that I want to suggest is that you know simply amyloid fibers are so easy to detect an image. Uh, I want to you know put the idea out there that maybe. Uh, in our reporting of fibers, this very distinctive structure might be a little bit overrepresented. And there's a lot of things that are more uh, you know, difficult to figure out in structural terms that people may have encountered and you know, either not characterized to their satisfaction or not published. So maybe that's another possible source of objects that don't fit the simple amyloid pattern. And so with this in mind, what we wanted to do is to go look at you know, some kind of an unbiased sample of aggregating proteins and you know, see how many of them would form fibers and whether fibers would be overrepresented in the spirit of the, of the models that I've presented, right? So you know, where do I find this unbiased sample? Well, unbiased is probably too much to ask, but what I'd really like to do is hire 10,000 postdocs and assign them 10,000 different proteins. Um, and then, you know, they all try to aggregate them under, you know, mild, relatively sticky condition, but not too much, right? Because you don't want to go into the bulk region that I've described before. Um, and then after two years, we have a group meeting and everybody says what they found. And uh, then we discuss how frequent, the, how frequent the, the fibers are. So I thought it was a very good idea, but um, the funding agencies didn't agree. So we settled for something a little bit different which consisted in essentially realizing that more or less there's already a whole community that's already doing those experiments for me. And this community is that of protein crystallographers. So what do protein crystallographers do? Maybe some of you are protein crystallographers. Well, they take proteins, which are you know, typically the type of objects that I like to think about. They're very irregular and they have different interactions depending on the, on the place where you look at. And they try to crystallize them with depleting agents, salts, surfactants, relatively mild, uh, mild aggregation condition because they want to get a nice crystal. And if you push them too strongly together, you get something amorphous and you don't get a very good scatter scattering signal out of it. And, uh, you know, they do this in those 96 well plates. And most of the time, 
they fail. So most of the uh, attempts to aggregate, to crystallize those proteins are unsuccessful, but there's a few of them that are successful. And then you put in under the um, X-ray beam and get a scattering picture out of it. But you know, lately there's a development that's actually very interesting. It's the fact that they've not only been uh, collecting data from the successful crystallizations that you can see with the naked eye, but they've started putting all of their um, trials inside those 96 ball plates and then the plate in a robot and everything under the X-ray beam. So that means that we have scattering data, not only for the things that are you know, bona fide crystals, but also for other things that are less well characterized, things that look like clear solutions or that you know, maybe look like precipitates and you don't have such a great idea of how what the microscopic structure is. And the hope is that we can tell from this data that is not at all designed to tell you what the aggregate structure is. So I wanna be very clear that for the specific application that I have in mind, this is very low quality data. Um, but the question is, can we get a little bit of a you know, signal that would indicate whether these things are fibers or bulks or solutions? And essentially the idea has been to uh, team up with um, these guys who work in uh, the two French synchrotrons, including uh, Bill, who's the uh, manager of the crystallography beam line at Soleil. And um, we've been starting to you know, put objects whose structure we knew under the X-ray beam and collect scattering intensity with the same protocol that people do with uh, crystallography experiments. And what we find is that you can essentially analyze those things with a principal component analysis, which is you know, a way to segregate data that doesn't make a lot of intuitive sense. But essentially the bottom line that I wanna put forward is that depending on, the, uh, on whether the objects were fibers or monomers or just a control buffer, they segregated, segregated in different regions of that principal component space, which essentially indicates that there appears to be some information that this procedure is uh, able to extract that would tell you whether an object that you haven't characterized before is a fiber or a monomer or maybe something different. But of course, as I said, right, we don't understand at all uh, which part of the, uh, of the data that the procedure is latching onto. And so in an attempt to better understand what uh, piece of the scattering data is modified if you go from one dimensionality to another, what we did is that um, in the computer with um, recently with, um, with an intern as well as my, with my student Lara Kura, uh, we've been trying to work out the uh, different scattering intensities that you get as a function of what objects you put in the computer. So we've just been taking protein structures from the protein data database and creating completely unrealistic objects, right? So I'm not pretending that the, the proteins are actually gonna dock in this fashion, but they're just dummy examples of something two-dimensional or three-dimensional or one-dimensional made out of proteins. And you get all kinds of different scattering profiles and it's very difficult to tell by, by, tell by eye which is which and what is a monomer and what is a fiber. But we've been feeding this to a machine learning uh, procedure. And again, it appears to be able to parse out the different dimensionalities. So this is you know, the true input dimension. And this is what the uh, algorithm has been able to guess. And in a large majority of the case, even though this is a super you know, preliminary endeavor, it's able to successfully guess the dimensionality of the object. So you know, the hope is that we can use this procedure on unlabeled data from actual crystallography experiments from users of the synchrotrons and get a little bit of an idea of you know, among the unsuccessful samples that they ran through the machine, which proportion of those were this dimensionality or that dimensionality. So we're really trying to use the you know, garbage from crystallographers, their unsuccessful um, crystal crystallization attempts. So you know, that's it about what I want to tell you guys. Um, so what's the bottom line, right? What should you, should you remember? And essentially the idea is that if you have objects that don't fit very well together, um, our suggestion is that this is a, a situation where the aggregates that they're going to form are going to have a tendency to be slim, to be fibers or maybe to be plain in order 
to uh, limit the amount of frustration that's building up inside, uh, inside your aggregate. And the implications, I think, are that maybe this um, just shifts the burden of proof in protein aggregation in the sense that, you know, before you essentially had proteins that came together and made a fiber and you had to explain why the fiber is here. Oh, that's because it's an amyloid. That's because the, you know, there's a hydrophobic interaction that, that you know, puts the monomers in this way and that way. But if you know, fiber is the default, then maybe the thing that you need to explain are actually the things that are not fibers. Uh, one reason why our friends at the synchrotrons are on board with um, the things that I've described is essentially that you know, if you can get a good understanding of how the aggregation of those proteins uh, proceeds, maybe you can get an understanding of how protein crystals nucleate. And if you do this, then that's essentially very good. You can uh, you know, get subtle signs that crystallization is around the corner and that might help them uh, direct users of the synchrotron towards better crystallization conditions. And you know, even though you're, I don't know how much of an embo thing it is to do, we're also really interested in the uh, material science aspect of this project and the idea that you can use this to design self-assembly, including of non-living machines. And of course, if there's any crystallographers among you, well, I'm always very interested in well-curated data from crystallography experiments. And so I'll be very happy to talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for this fantastic talk. Um, I think we should better start with the questions. And I, I saw many were coming in, um, some in chat, some in Q&A. So um, let's start with Q&A first. And I think um, actually Maturima was the first one. They asked, um, the aggregation depends on the surface tension of aggregating molecules, oh, okay. or is it also related to the surface tension of solvent? So the thing that really matters is the difference in free energy between the two particles being in contact and the two particles being apart, right? And that difference involves both. It involves the surface tension of the solvent because as you, you know, take the particles that are together and put them apart, then what you're doing is that you're uh, essentially creating more of an interface between the, the, the particles and the solvent. And so that means that you're, uh, you know, this is gonna be unfavorable if the surface tension of the solvent is high. And of course the adhesion energy of the particles, if you put them uh, together in this way, you have more of an interface between the particles. Um, that matters as well. So, you know, it's really a difference of the two. Right, uh, thank you. And then someone related, Ozan asked, should I quite understand, what is the surface tension of superconductivity molecules? Maybe that's a typo, but maybe also, um, yeah, maybe perhaps uh, I'm not exactly sure what superconductivity means in this, in this context. So if you, maybe if you could, um, you know, comment on your own question and, yeah. and perhaps um, explain what superconductivity means in this case. <laughs> Um, so Buzz. I think, the, I think the person who asked the question is coming online as a participant. Yes, um, Ozan, oh, cool. you can um, you can use the uh, the microphone if you'd like to to comment on your question. All right. So if Ozan wants to elaborate, maybe we can. Yeah. Um, do it when yeah. <laughs> so let's go. I mean, I'm just thematically organizing the question. So Buzz is asking, so he um, loved the talk, and he's asking if the hard problem for most proteins is to work as monomers. If so, can you test this in protein structure data by comparing your 288 molecules? So is it hard to be, yeah, to work as a monomer? So to work as monomer means to, to stay apart from each other. I guess, yes. Um, so I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think the, the comment in this respect is that if you take the 288 molecules that we've, you know, put um, put put in the in the program, if you take down to their uh, to their um, ground state, essentially there's few, if any, that stay in the, in the state of monomers. 
So they, um, they essentially all come together. So, you know, in a way what Buzz is perhaps pointing out is that the proteins that I'm, so I'm, I'm looking at in the simulation, I'm looking at generic particles, right? That are not selected to do anything, uh, but, you know, proteins that are normally soluble, you know, have been selected for something or, you know, for many things probably, but one of the things that they've been selected for is to remain in solution. So in this case, the uh, sample that I'm looking at is biased uh, towards particle that will tend to aggregate with each other. Um, so I think that's a, that's a fair comment. There's a way in which you can uh, you know, discuss this, which is also the idea that you can uh, tweak the amount of surface tension that you have in your, in your system. So you, know, you might think of it of the surface tension in relation to the temperature of the system. And at the end of the day, maybe what that boils down to is that if a protein, I mean, in the simplest sense, so if a protein is selected to work as a monomer, that would correspond to a higher um, temperature um, run of the simulation or something like this. Um, but I would, you know, I would tend to agree that this piece is, is missing, right? Yeah, so that's exactly what he's saying. Are, are there among your 20, 288 that never aggregates? Kind of follow up to that. Ah, yes, very, um, very few, if any. Yeah. Well, thank Buzz. So, Maria um, Alfonso Moira, she's asking, well, first of all, she would like to have references for this work. Um, and she's asking if you're using Kinetic Monte Carlo in all the cases you show, in particular for the first part in 2D. Are the molecules diffusing or are they just kind of placed in the lowest energy state? And is it possible to have several particles arriving at the same time? Okay. Um, so in the in everything but, but the first example, we're using, you know, simple Monte Carlo. So essentially, we don't necessarily have a notion of time. We want to get to the ground state of the system. So Monte Carlo is appropriate. Um, in the first example, it's a weird algorithm. And that's actually the only one that we currently have a reference for. There's more coming, I promised, but uh, that's the one that's out yet. And it's our uh, 2017 paper um, with Tom Whitten. And uh, the um, algorithm in this case is essentially what I described. It's a you know, steepest descent, short-sighted algorithm, greedy algorithm, where you just locally test all the possibilities for adding one particle, and you can only add one at a time, and you always choose the locally best solution. So it won't necessarily take you to the ground state, and this is something that we discuss in the paper, um, but it may make sense in terms of protein aggregation, because in many cases, this protein aggregation is irreversible and probably does something short-sighted that's at least in some sense similar to what we do. Thank you. And then David Desanche is asking, so you've been speaking about frustration throughout your talk, but in protein folding, we typically define frustration in relation to the maximized energy gap between folded and unfolded state. And probably this is also meaningful for binding. So can you please elaborate more on what you define as frustration? Okay, so frustration is absolutely great in that nobody agrees on what frustration means. Uh, and the notion of frustration that people use in protein folding, I think is inherited from spin glasses which, you know, it's a great day to talk about spin glasses after yesterday, right? Um, and uh, in that sense, it's a, it's a very similar notion, right? And I think the, the definition that the people from those different communities would agree on is that a frustrated situation is a situation where you cannot, so you have, you know, several objects that interact together and you cannot have a state that favors, that, you know, satisfies all the two body interactions in your system simultaneously. So in the same sense that in protein folding, uh, you know, if you take a generic hetero, heteropolymer, which doesn't have that uh, uh, minimal frustration idea built into it, which pre, pre, presumably is built in by, uh, by evolution, that's what you know, people say in the field, then you, know, you can have this residue that's friends with that residue, but then the residue next to it is probably gonna have an unfavorable interaction that's gonna make for a very disordered free energy landscape. Well, in our sense, it's also similar, right? Said, except we're not thinking of interactions between residues, but we're thinking between interactions between whole particles. And the difference with the notion in spin glasses and you know, the anti-ferromagnet is that the um, interaction in our case is not isotropic, but essentially whether the interaction is gonna be favorable depends 
on what face you're presenting to the particle next to you. So, you know, it's similar in some senses, but, uh, but it's not directly equivalent in others. Well, I hope David that uh, answers your question. So Maria still has a um, question, last question, <laughs> she thinks, but uh, please, uh, Maria, feel free to stay later to um, just chat. Uh, why nature sh could choose this intermediate surface tension that produces the formation of fibers instead of bulk structures? Well, I think if uh, if nature did the blunder, I think it, it relates to Buzz's question, right? So if if you make proteins that are super sticky, then everything crashes out of solution. And you're you know something horrible happens to your cells. So that part is probably selected for by evolution. That you know essentially the cell places itself at a place where its particles are not too sticky otherwise you just would have everything crash out and then everything's over thank you um there's still i think ozan commented in molecular collisions solvent atmosphere is also effective for example elastic collisions can be obtained in the martian atmosphere <laughs> so it's um, um i don't think I'm not sure how that's the case, but that's not exactly your question. <laughs> no, it's, it's an interesting comment, then, though. And then I think there was okay, so got in, in terms of elastic collisions, right? So, in, in, in this case, we're really thinking of a system that's overdamped. Um, I mean, in, in response to Ozan, right? So, we're thinking of a system that's overdamped, so it's not exactly elastic collisions that we have in mind, right? You have to think of objects that diffuse towards another and then, you know, find a reasonably effective way to connect in an energetic sense. Um, and then uh, Goxon, he had, or she had a comment. There is accumulated data from single particle cryo as well, which you might want to consider. Yes, 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 yes. There's that, uh, yes. So yes, thank you very much. It's an, it's an excellent comment. I didn't mention it, but that's among the things that we aim to mine. <laughs> Um, and then Ozan still says molecular speciation and diversity can also be increased if the polygon refraction angle is moved out of the dimension space and an orthogonal surface is taken in the ecliptic plane. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's within the, ch uh, the chat. Yeah, yeah. Um, you want to comment I see. I, I mean, it, you know, it, it sounds like an interesting thought, but uh, it's uh, not something that I'm managing to wrap my head around right now. So if you, you know, want to write and... Um, yeah, or simply stay uh, later. Yeah. So this is now it's um, three or two, depending where you are. Um, I think maybe it's time to wrap up this part and then we can all stay and discuss kind of face-to-face uh, -face in the next 20 minutes or so. But I would just like to thank everyone for coming today and I remind you of the next talk, which will happen on November 3rd, stress kinases in cardiometabolic diseases. And I would like to thank Martin again for a fantastic talk. So um, those who have signed up to meet the speaker, please stay, or even if you haven't signed up, uh, you're also welcome to stay. And uh, otherwise, uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>